e andare incontro al futuro con la determinazione non soltanto di credere alle nuove idee, quanto di fuggire dalle vecchie. have no control over critical phenomena that are affecting our future and threatening it. Take your pick. Climate change, mounting inequalities, loss in biodiversity, rogue finance, permanent budgetary crisis of nation states and endemic conflict. Everyone agrees that these are bad and something should be done about them. And yet, they defeat everything we throw at them. What's going on here? They seem to exist out of our reach, somehow. The explanation might be in a process called emergence. That's a natural science concept. The idea is that a great many interacting units give rise to a phenomenon that exists at a higher scale than that of the units themselves. And that unit that emerges has its own law of motion and its own patterns of behavior. A good example is a cloud. What we think of as a cloud is in a pattern of suspended water molecules. Now, water molecules are all identical. You could look at one until the end of time and you would never be able to determine whether it is part of a cloud or what in it causes the cloud to exist. There are many things like clouds. For example, you can think of ant colonies as an emergent property of a great many individual ants that interact. You can think of your own mind as an emergent property of your neurons that are exchanging electric and chemical signals, and so on. So if we carry this line of reasoning onto social and economic phenomena, you might think of something like, say, a global crisis as an emergent property of billions of individuals and organizations that interact. And this includes businesses, governments, and banks. So, no wonder we can't touch them. They don't exist at our scale. If we hope to solve these problems, perhaps we need to deploy tools that exist at the same scale as the problems they are meant to solve. But then you might say, what about democracy? The democratic process is the place where we scale our individual action to the collective level, right? It is, but I would argue it is in a way that doesn't give rise to true emergence. Here's why. Democracies are based on representation. Citizens choose a representative, and that person is in charge of making decisions in their name and for the common good. But even the smartest, best-meaning, and hardest-working of elected representatives cannot hope to incorporate in her mental maps all of the wealth of information, skills, passion of citizens. So almost all of the available brain power is lost at step one. Then that person makes decisions that are implemented through administrative processes. An administrative process is a, is a transmission mechanism designed to be a simple relay of decisions made at the top. It has a lot of advantages, but one of them is not that it deals well with the unexpected, and that includes it can't really process any unsolicited information or advice that is coming from citizens. So you see, in representative democracies, you really have not very many people making decisions, and the people that are cannot really interact freely because most of them are locked into place in a hierarchy. So, not enough people, not enough interaction, no emergence. You are still at the individual level. There is another way that we might cook up 
collective action. It's called participation. In a participatory democracy, citizens find an issue they care about and join a discussion about it, bringing to it their full knowledge. That knowledge is then processed by other citizens and eventually hammered out into consensus and then action. No information is lost and citizens are very free to interact with each other. So we might expect some sort of collective intelligence to emerge that operates at a higher scale than the processing ability of the individual human mind. The problem with that is that participation does not scale. As the number of participants increases, so does the, cost of comp the, the complexity cost of participation. And the whole process very soon hits the ceiling and it becomes unmanageable and it breaks down. So the conventional wisdom of our participation is you can use it to run a village, but a whole planet, no. It is powerless in the face of global problems. Now, the conventional wisdom is changing fast because now we have the internet. And suddenly, mass participation starts to look like a serious possibility. The best known example of mass collaboration online is, of course, Wikipedia. English Wikipedia is the largest encyclopedia ever written, more than four million entries, all of which have been written by volunteers, who every day, with no money, no command structure, without even knowing each other, work together to build something that is highly coherent in aim, style, method. This is an astounding feat. It really looks like some sort of emerging collective intelligence. How do we explain it? I like to explain it by self-selection and social networks. Self-selection means this. Each individual can decide autonomously whether to participate in Wikipedia, which entries to work on, and when. There is no directive to go by. And this allows every person in the system to position herself right at the point of maximum impact, where she's working on stuff she's knowledgeable about, and minimum effort right at the point where she's working on something that she cares about when she's ready for it. So the matching of Wikipedia editors and entries is completely emergent. No one in the system needs to keep track of what millions of people know and care about. Social networks means that the software and the social norms underpinning Wikipedia encourage individuals that work on the same entry to interact and reach a consensus. Now, the product of that interaction is emergent. But the rules of that interaction are not emergent at all. They are designed. Online communities are a fascinating object because they are emergent social phenomena that embod embed, embed a strong element of design. And elements of design might be software functionalities like Wikipedia's famous edit button, social norms like moderation policies, narratives, gamification features. Online environments can be tweaked at will with very little cost. So there is a lot of headroom to attempt to precisely channel individual person-to-person -person interaction. It gets better. Everything that happens online has to be encoded in a database for technical reasons. So with online social interaction, you get perfect monitoring for free or for very cheap. So you can now design individual interaction and then measure precisely the social structure that emerged from that interaction. And this is a complete game changer. Of course, we have a great tool for thinking about social interaction and social structure, graphs or networks. Let me give you an example. I spent most of last year directing a project at the Council of Europe called Edge Riders. Edge Riders is a distributed think tank. It's an open group of citizens, mostly young, that collaborate online on a reform proposal for European youth policies. After a few months of work, Edge Riders have produced several thousands of pages of content. And you might ask yourself, isn't this now hitting a ceiling? Isn't, isn't this process near, near the point where it breaks down because it becomes overwhelming and nobody can stay on top of the conversation anymore? This is the same thing as asking, is the edge riders environment scalable or not? It turns out I can measure that. First, I model edge riders as a network of comments. 
Individuals are connected when they comment each other's content. Then I run an algorithm that looks at the connectivity structure of this network and breaks it down into sub-communities. A sub-community is defined by its members being more connected with each other than with the rest of the network. The algorithm tells us that this sub-community structure is pretty clear-cut and it is very unlikely that it would appear by random interaction. We conclude that some force is at work giving this particular network its shape. Now, sub-communities in edge riders are an emergent property of interaction on edge riders because nobody is forcing anybody to interact with anyone else. However, this interaction happens through channels that are the result of design choices made by the project team. Specifically, there is one that might have influenced this. Discussion topics in edge riders were not released all at, all at once, but rather sequentially, at four weeks' intervals. So, when a topic was active, people that cared about that particular issue could find each other and get a conversation going. Weeks later, the project would move on to the next topic, but these people would still be in touch, and sometimes they would keep talking about the same topic. And we can see this if we look at the growth of the network over time. And you can see sub-communities shown in different colors that come online in bursts sequentially rather than slowly growing all at the same time. We conclude that as the number of participants increase in this network, the result is not an increase in the noise level. Rather, it is an increase in specialization with the network becoming better and better at a sort of parallel computing where different discussions can be managed at the same time by allocating people in the appropriate way. This makes for a pretty scalable environment and the scalability is at least in part the result of a design choice. Now, this is just an example, but you can see where I'm going with this. You can now tweak the interaction environment and then check that your tweak has nudged the emergent social dynamic in the direction you want it to go. This is a promise to do something that seemed impossible and even contradictory. Design emergent social dynamics, like, in my case, a scalable organic growth process. This is a big deal because it's a sort of level up move. We can now hope to mobilize emergent phenomena to which, which, which we can control to some degree, like the collective intelligence of a millions of connected human beings, to help us with emergent phenomena that we don't control at all and are actually threatening the planet's balance and our well-being as a species. We have a fighting chance because if we can deploy such a collective intelligence, then we are building a measure, a response, finally at the same scale as the threat. In order to seize the chance, we will need to take online participatory democracy very seriously. And that means enabling self-selection, trusting our fellow citizens to behave as citizen experts. We'll need to build online environments for them, which they perceive as safe, fully respectful of their privacy, among other things. We will need to get over issues of representativeness. And finally, we will need to lead by example, getting elected officials and civil servants to use these systems and show trust in them. It won't be, it won't be easy at all. It will take a lot of trial and error, but it can be done. The dream of a working participatory democracy has been with us for 25 centuries. We have held on to it for so long, and now is the time to finally make it come true. Grazie.